internet friend, this is Magic Brad with Synergy Cafe and the Synergy Collaborative and magicbrad.com. And I'm here on a, what is it? It's Tuesday, Good News Day, and I've got a friend, Jim Mosquera. Did I say it right? Jim Mosquera, yeah, it's good. Mosquera, not bad. Hey, is it Italian? No, it's, uh, it's actually Hispanic. I'm from Panama originally. Aha, Mosquera. I got a, I'm working on a project in Costa Rica. That's kind of close, isn't it? There you go, yeah. Okay. So, Jim, I don't do these very long because we got that commodity of time and we don't want to take too much of people's time. But if they are interested, they can recontact you and we'll share that at the end of the video. But first off, who's Jim? You're married, got kids, you're single, you're wild and crazy. Who are you? Uh, married with uh, one child. He's uh, just started college not long ago. Um, about uh, my, my professional career was spent primarily in the telecommunications industry dealing with technology. Uh, but during that whole time, I always had a very keen interest in money. I uh, acquired a Series 3 examination. A friend of mine and I, we were thinking about uh, doing what would be a precursor to today's hedge funds, which is managing commodity money for pension funds and things of that nature. Then I started a family and then kind of stayed on my telecommunications path. Uh, published my first uh, book in 2010 on the financial markets and the economy. Had a newsletter. I wrote for a, an online publication called examiner.com. I had my own column there again talking about things related to finances and, and, and the economics of the United States. Uh, and then my company offered uh, a, a buyout package, if you will, about four years ago, and I took it and then started a boutique consultancy called Sentinel Consulting. And that's focused on what I'll call three pillars, general business consulting, alternative finance, and then debt restructuring. Got it. Well, that's a good industry to be in, the whole money thing, you know, because that's something that we kind of need. Even though people are thinking this cryptocurrency thing is going to be the new deal, and they buy this, uh, this what is it, Bitcoin and all these other different kinds of coins. I think the, the blockchain technology might be around for a while, but I think those coins are going to do all sorts of goofy stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I still write a lot for some online financial journals, and probably two of my three most recent articles happen to be on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And the, the last article I wrote was in mid-December probably about two to three days before the most recent significant top in the entire Bitcoin market. And I was kind of warning investors about, you know, what was going on in the cryptocurrency market and, uh, you know, the utility of cryptocurrencies and, you know, how you, know, how, how you should really look at, at, at in evaluating cryptocurrencies. Well, you were, you're involved with money, so you understand what money actually is. It's just a measurement system for energy, in my opinion. It's just a byproduct of work, how much energy you put out. And someone says, I will give you this much for an hour of your labor, whatever you do. And it's just a measurement system. That's why we've got it goes up and down and changes and changes in different countries because the, the energy is different. So it's just a, just that. And when you get into something like a, like a cryptocurrency, I think they're trying to standardize that like we try and do with gold. But the reality yeah. is it's just, uh, it's just energy. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because in my first two nonfiction books, I have a nonfiction series and a fiction series, but in my nonfiction series, one of the very first things I talk about, uh, which I, I like to set the foundation and the fundamentals of things, is money. You know, and I, I describe money as the most important economic invention in history because it replaced something that people did before, which was barter and exchange. Right. And so we're trying to exchange value. So now we've all recognized something that we've agreed and accepted and has three important characteristics in order to allow it to become that money. Yeah, I, I, I like to kind of take things back to the essence of it. You think about way, way, way back before money was around, they had like buttons and blankets, and they said, you know what, I've got plenty of these buttons, but I'm kind of cold, so I wonder if maybe you trade some buttons for a blanket. And they trade back and forth, and all of a sudden they go, you know what, I've got plenty of buttons, I've got plenty of blankets, I really don't need anything else. That's where they got to figure out something else. Let's create, And it gets creative, and that's where they create the next thing, and that's where inflation comes from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very and cool. and there, there's some dif definitions in my book around what's inflation, what's deflation. It's not even really exactly what people think necessarily. Um, you know, people think about inflation and deflation in terms of pricing. You know, so that's the effect of, you know, the inflation and deflation. Um, but, you know, the inflation and deflation primarily is a result of the quantity of that money thing that we were talking about before. But even within the last, let's say, since the financial crisis, or, you know, 10 years since, uh, there have been a lot of people that have been very, very concerned about that we're going to have this massive hyperinflation because the Fed's doing this, this, and this. But you know, one thing that's often missed in that in that calculus is that uh, in order for inflation to happen, that money has to get out there and circulate. And right. without that happening, uh, you, you don't get that inflation. And it's and it's kind of interesting because you know a lot of the basis of what I do as a consultant now 
is helping small businesses try to get some of that money circulation back out so it goes into their coffers, you know, so they can use it productively. And and that's something, uh, Brad, that changed dramatically after 2008 in the financial crisis because banks became more reluctant, obviously, to extend that credit to small businesses. So right. what my boutique firm does is it really tries to match um, small businesses or investors, you know, if it's real estate transactions and things of that nature, to I pools see. of money so they can then invest you know, productively in our economy because, uh, again, what happened in 2008, financial regulation, you know, Dodd-Frank, and then there's some, ge you know, some general conservatism on the part of banks, which is a good thing because you know, you're a depositor in a bank, I'm a depositor in a bank, and we want banks to be good stewards of our money. Well, you're, we're, we're on the same page because I, I was just going to ask you what, in my head, I said, I was thinking real estate. I was going to say, do you do anything in the world of real estate? Because I look again, I look at the essence of things and we're always going to need some kind of shelter, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of security. We're always going to need some kind of shelter. So I've invested some of my money into REITs because it's, you know, what REITs are right. Real estate investment yeah. trust. Yeah. It, I think it's secure because it deals with shopping centers and commercial and residential and vacation homes and retirement homes and storage lockers. It's pretty uh, diverse and I think we're always going to need it. And there was that 2008 thing, but it's still, it's always going to go up because we need a place. And that's part of the reason why I'm putting some of this money into a resort or a retreat event center in Costa Rica, because then I can get that cash flow. Because when it's stuck in my REITs account, I'm not in control. Right. But if I move it over into something that's a, a venture that I can do, I can, I can scale it up. So I'm in more right. control of it. That's right. Very cool. Yeah, and, and, you know, and, and the goal of all this effort is, of course, you know, if, if you're like me, you know, my passions are around, you know, making sure that we have a, a strong, sound economy. Because if you don't have a strong, sound economy, you know, other social uh, things can erupt from that and you get social instability. Yep. And when you get social instability, you know, you have demagoguery that could evolve, you know, politically. And, you know, we saw that in the 1930s in Germany, uh, you know, they were struggling under the weight of inflation, you know, post World War One. You know, peace trees that put a lot of financial burdens on them. So, so the goal of all this is uh, society's better off when it's sound economically. And you get sound economic when you have productive small businesses growing, employing people, and so forth. And we've had a disturbing trend since 2008, Brad, which is, you know, we've actually had more business deaths than we have small business births. And so we want to try to correct that imbalance because what's happening is you're having people dropping out of the workforce or they're going to work for very, very large companies, which again, nothing wrong with that, but we want to see that vibrancy in the small business sector as well. I'm an advocate of that. I think everybody should be self-employed in my opinion, or at least have a side hustle. <laughs> <laughs> that's, just, that's just my opinion. So uh, let's get into like how you operate. Do you, are you like an online coach or do you have an actual office that people come and visit you? Do you do both? And actually, you're you're kind of looking at my office right now, which is in the uh, the basement of my home. Uh, you know, I, I I chose to. There's mine. <laughs> that, yeah, I chose to not have an office front. Uh, I do a lot of networking. I'm, in, I'm involved in some uh, you know chamber of commerces, uh, you know professional networking organizations like mm -hmm. BNI Business Networking International and others uh, to try to un, you know to get people to understand what my business is. I try to establish a lot of relationships within the banking industry with accountants and attorneys. So they understand that there's resources out there for small businesses to, you know, to get credit when, when they cannot obtain that credit from the commercial right. banking industry. Yeah. I noticed in the real estate world, there's a lot of hard money lenders that it's private money instead of banks because it's, uh, it's a little easier to do. <laughs> right. So, and, and, you know, and, and understanding too, that when you're dealing with a commercial bank, there's regular regulatory burdens that are placed on them. You know, when, right. when we're talking about uh, the financial institutions with whom I deal, uh, it's oftentimes private money or it may be individuals. Let's say you and I, Brad, go into business and we have a line of credit, a regular line of credit from a bank. And then we decide how we're going to divvy that money out to small businesses. We do our own underwriting and so forth. Sure. So. Uh, we're not going to be regulated because, again, we're not we're, we're not stewards of anyone's money, but the bank is. And again, and, and that's and that's really how we want to do that mm -hmm. um, for the economy, because, you know, one thing that people need to understand is the absolute worst thing that you could ever have economically in a country is a run on banks, which is, means there's people standing outside a bank line going around yep. the block waiting to, to withdraw their money, because if that ever happens, you will get an immediate bank holiday declared by the president that could last any number of days. Yeah. And again, yeah. that if you want to lock up a financial market and an economy, that's that's how to do it. And we see. don't want that. 
I saw that a couple years back in Brazil, where the Cruzeiro and the Cruzaro, they just had too many zeros, so they cut some zeros off. That's all they really did, is just readjusted it. But people panicked because it seemed like they had less money, and they went and they took all their money out, and it was pretty chaotic. <laughs> yeah, and that gets to that point about the inflation that we talked about, is that in that particular case, you know, there's a bunch of money, and it's circulating very quickly. People want to take that money, and they want to spend it as quickly as they can, because like you said, the next time it gets issued, there's one more zero added to it. And so now you have less you know, than you had before from a purchasing power perspective. Well, I think it's smart that you're a home office like that. I think that might be a mistake that some people make is they end up getting the real office and it ends up being an expense. And no fault of the people that are offering the retail stores because they have to charge that much because they've got uh, you know, their insurance and their liabilities and their uh, gas and water and electricity. They got to pay. They got to charge that much. But that puts a big burden on your business. Whereas you've got your home, which is you can write part of that off, right? Yeah, and not only that, I explained to somebody the other day, like the phone system that I have is a very unique one because it's internet based, and I could set up my company, if you will, with having you know satellites. Uh, I, I could, you could be a satellite of mine and basically be right. off my phone system. I'm extension 101. You could be extension 102. And to somebody calling, it looks all the same, like we're in the same geographic sure. footprint. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the location freedom. The stuff that I do, there's three things to it. There's the financial freedom, because you're in charge of your own money. And then there's the time freedom, because you can work whenever you want. I was up at 4 o'clock this morning doing things. And then there's the location freedom, where I'm going to go to Costa Rica, and I'll just uh, plug in here and be able to still continue my progress. That's right. So before I ask my favorite question, maybe you could share with people how to get a hold of you or if you've got something on your website that you offer, maybe a little sampler or something. Want to share that, a website? Yeah. My uh, my business website is uh, Sentinel Consulting. So that's S-E-N-T-I-N-E-L and then consulting.biz. So that's dot B-I-Z. Um, there's uh, resources there for people to kind of learn and understand. Some of the topics, actually, Brad, that we've talked about this morning, um, you'll, they'll, you'll see some other uh, interviews that I've conducted that kind of talk about it, and maybe in a little more depth about some of the things I do with small businesses. Um, we talked earlier off the air, if people are interested uh, from a reading perspective or an audio perspective, I actually have an author site that's under my name. That's jimmoscara.com. So that's J-I-M-M-O-S-Q-U-E-R-A.com. And there uh, you'll see my nonfiction series, again, which deals with finance and economics and money. And then I actually have a fictional series that we talked about off air, which deals with politics, financial crisis, cyber terror, and the protagonist is a journalist. And I think readers, readers or listeners, because these, this is actually also on audiobooks that people you know, would rather listen oh, cool. instead of read, there's actually um, a, some very, very close parallels, I think, to kind of what you see kind of occurring in society today. And really, the fictional series uh, is, has a lot of social messaging, if you will, that's kind of encapsulated within the story and the characters that kind of it really is a cautionary tale about, you know, what can happen in a society, you know, when you have financial crisis, you have greater government authority and how different parties may react to it, particularly politically. Got it. Okay, well, I'm going to ask my favorite question, and that's the big why question. But uh, maybe after this, you want to stay on a little bit longer and we'll chat further. But uh, maybe you could send those links to me in Facebook. Um, I do a lot of work on Facebook because that's where everybody lives these days. And uh, I will put those links in this when I put it up and propagate it out to the universe. Okay. But here's the big why question. Why are you doing this in this financial world when you could possibly be a martial arts instructor or a parachute operator or a start your own farm? Why are you doing this? Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned martial arts because I actually have a martial, a little bit of a martial arts background. And then later, as, a, as an adult, I did something called a Commando Krav Maga, which is what they teach oh. the Israeli Defense Forces. So I, I have a little bit of that background. But, <laughs> you know, the why, I think, is, you know, we were talking off air. I'm pretty passionate about uh, finance and economics. And, I mean, and growing up, my dad and I, we, we had a common bond talking about money. Uh, my dad came from, I would, I would describe as incredibly humble beginnings in Panama uh, to the point that, uh, you know, the, the the projects, as you would describe, the housing and maybe some of the large cities here that were built in the 60s and 70s, they would be superior to where he grew up in Panama City. Um, so, uh, you know, that that humility about money, you know, saving, conserving, and, and, and that kind of, for me, it kind of then extended into the concept of, okay, having a strong, healthy economy. Well, I told you I wrote about that, right, in my in my nonfiction series. I'm kind of talking about that in a in and again in a fictional sense in my fictional series as a cautionary tale. But you know, we can't have a healthy, vibrant economy without small to mid-sized businesses flourishing. You know, and 
when you look at companies today, like the Googles of the world, you know, the Amazons of the world, you know, you know, some of these companies that are a little bit larger, you know, they were small companies at one point in time, you know, and, and they, they were able to obtain some sort of financing to keep going, you know, whether that was self-financing, friends financing, whatever it is. And that is something that, you know, I see often that companies fail because of inadequate financing or financing and budgeting, you know, and having that plan to take themselves to the next level. Got it. Well, this has been fascinating. I like talking about money because it's a it's a weird topic for people. And uh, like I said, it's, a, it's like a, I believe it's just a byproduct of energy. And I think the reason people don't like talking about money sometimes is because it's really personal. You know, it is. So it is. I'm going to sign this one off and beam it up to the internet. But I appreciate you taking the time to be on Synergy Cafe. Great being on with you, Brad. Okay, stay on. We'll have a little chat later. But thank you very much. Peace. Bye bye.